Great, thank you, Michelle. Good evening. Come on, you guys have to be more interactive. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, much, much better, much better. It is just an absolute honor and pleasure to be here today. Um, it's good to see all of you back after four years. Um, and a lot has happened in four years besides the pandemic. And I'm going to focus on, as soon as I get my slides moving to the title slide, that really, if you look at the three major things that has happened in the last four years that we were not able to meet in person besides the pandemic that impacts the energy system, number one, we all were talking about net zero future. But net zero future is 2050, 2070. There are more than 100 countries who came to Glasgow last year, the UN Climate Summit, COP26. And now aspirations are ambitions grounded by 2030 target. 2030 is only eight years away. So now we got to measure ourselves how well we are doing for a 2030 target. Have your phones ready because I'm going to ask a question to see if you know what your 2030 target is for your country. But it's not only that aspiration and ambition. We knew that we have to do this affordably, reliably. And you're now in Europe. Just two days ago, the future power price in France and Germany were exceeding one euro per kilowatt hour. That's a thousand dollars a megawatt hour. Future winter prices are approaching two euros a kilowatt hour. Clearly, energy security is front, line, and center. And there are countless millions of people that will suffer because of the energy prices. I was reading a report on, in the UK, 50% of UK household will be in energy poverty by this December. So while we are keeping our focus on long-term, net zero, 2030 target, we'll also have to make sure that energy security becomes a central piece of this decarbonization. And then finally, the third one, we knew about it. We knew that the climate was changing. We knew there was preponderance of scientific evidence that climate is changing. So the IPCC report, that's the global group of scientists that generates the research, came out just a couple of months ago. And it was the, as if we needed more proof. It clearly showed that climate has already changed, globe has already warmed, the Paris Climate Treaty of 1.5 degrees C, most likely we may reach by 2030, 2035. And they had some prediction. They had prediction based on their science that flooding, heat wave, cold wave, one in a hundred year events would be one in a 10 year events. The last six hottest year in, on earth since we are measuring temperature for almost 130 years was the last six years. If you look at the flood in Germany, if you look at the flood is going on right now in Pakistan, if you look at what happened last year in Europe with the wind drought, clearly the system that we designed for the weather of the future needs to be redesigned for the next weather. For the weather of the past needs to be redesigned for the weather of the future. So that's the context for going to the slides, if I can change the slides. And as the slides are being worked on, yeah, that's the, what I'm gonna start with is the thing about decarbonization 2030 target, only eight years from now. I'm gonna show a short video that puts the US numbers in perspective. And then after the video, I'm gonna come back and ask you questions on what is the situation in your country. So let's play the video of the US 2030 decarbonization goals. The Electric Power Research Institute is examining the pace of U.S. carbon emission reduction based on the goal of cutting economy-wide emissions in half by 2030. Across the U.S. economy, annual energy-related carbon emissions declined one gigaton between 2005 and 2020, 
Driving CO2 about 50% below 2005 levels by 2030 means tripling the rate of decarbonizing ocean, accelerating from a one gigaton reduction over 15 years to one gigaton every five years. Additional reductions are expected in the decades ahead as the U.S. targets net zero emissions economy-wide by 2050. Between 2005 and 2020, the power sector reduced its carbon emissions by 35%, driven by end-use efficiency gains, coupled with natural gas and renewables replacing coal. The electric sector reductions will need to accelerate over the coming decade to achieve a three times increase in the economy-wide pace. With high solar and wind penetration and advanced low carbon technologies emerging, achieving net zero power sector emissions will take time and involve substantial technology innovation to make the transition affordable and reliable. The transportation, buildings and industry sectors achieved relatively small carbon reductions between 2005 and 2020. These sectors will have to substantially accelerate reductions to meet 2030 goals. Electrification will play a central role in the decades ahead. Transportation, buildings and industry are expected to continue reducing emissions, powered by electrification, low carbon fuels and carbon capture and storage. The development of negative emission technologies will benefit all sectors. The power sector is poised to play a crucial role in realizing the U.S. carbon goals in the coming decades through direct emission reductions and by enabling reductions in transportation, buildings and industry. As we decarbonize and further electrify the transportation and building sectors, we simultaneously need to ensure the electric grid can withstand the changing weather and climate of today and tomorrow. Adapting the grid and proactively planning upgrades to handle extreme weather require evaluating trends in future climate projections, assessing grid vulnerabilities, and investing in robust risk mitigation options that account for regional differences. Maintaining and improving resilience will be a critical part of the decarbonization journey as we seek to build a clean, affordable, safe and reliable energy future. That puts in perspective what we have to do today. A couple of things in the video that you saw force the timeline, the past, the present, which is this decade, and the future. So the past, and this is not just US, in almost every country, the power sector has done the best job in reducing the carbon emission. But if we are concerned about climate change, we should be concerned about carbon dioxide reduction from all over the economy. That's transportation, that's buildings, that's industry. If you look at the present, what I'm gonna spend more of the time on, the present, it cannot be just power sector getting cleaner. And this is where, from a CGRE perspective, this organization, I know we are power system expertise, but our region is broadening. We need to work with transportation, we need to work with buildings, we need to work with industry. And that will help us to achieve our 2030 goal. But going beyond 2030, going to net zero, you can't electrify everything. You cannot electrify maritime shipping. You cannot electrify aircrafts, big, large, transcontinental planes. You can't electrify cement, steel industry. So what do you do? What you do is one option. There's a lot of work going on. And Seagray is already engaged, but needs to be even more engaged. Clean electricity will create clean molecules. The molecules are hydrogen. The molecules are liquid ammonia. The molecules are synthetic methane. This is what will provide the jet fuel and the maritime fuel of the future. So if you are at with CGRE or IEEE or IEC or EPRI, any other organization, if you're an electric utility company, the future will be shaped by you, not just the future of the power system, but the future of the energy system. And I would say if we are not successful, what is in doubt is the future of humanity. Because if you look at what's happening because of climate change, whether around the world, we cannot let this go continue in the same pace. 
So let me get your, get your phone up. Get your phone up, we'll start the first question. And if I can get to the first question, the first question would be, do you, if you know your country's 2030 goal that was set up at the last year's Glasgow Climate Summit, how confident you are that those goals could be met, which is only eight years from now? The US was 50%. That's gonna be a pretty ambitious goal. And we'll give you maybe 30 seconds for these answers. So I'm gonna see what, um, I like it. Difficult, but achievable. I would have said the same thing from a US perspective if I could vote. It's not mission impossible, but it will become mission impossible if what's happening in Europe and Asia and in, in North and South America related to energy security continues. If what's happening on supply chain continues, it will soon will become mission impossible. So we all need to make sure we are working together to make this achievable, even though it's going to be an extremely challenging thing. And we got eight more years left, not a lot of time left. Let me move to the second question. And the second question relates to, oh, before I move to the second question, I show the US challenge. So this is the US challenge, and you all have the same challenge. If you look at that graph, busy graph, the colors are different types of generation resource. The one below zero is things that are retired, and the one above zero are the amount of generating capacity that is being built. For US to meet its 2050 goal, that's the amount of primarily wind and solar will have to be built in the next 10 years. Look at that, those bars, look at those columns. Only once in the history we have been able to install that much generation. Now we gotta do it year over year, year over year for the next eight years. That's how challenging that is. But just cleaning up the generation sector is not really where the major technical challenge is. The major technical challenge is on the grid side. So if I can get this work, I'm going to go to the Slido question after this. So get your phone up. And I know this is right in your wheelhouse, and you can only pick one answer. I know the answer would be all four are needed, Ashad. You need a grid-forming inverter for a future that would be significantly more renewable. You need long-duration storage. Guess what long-duration storage we have today? It's called natural gas, and it's called oil, and it's called coal. We need to figure out energy storage for days, weeks, for seasons. Distribution, the whole periphery of the grid, it needs to be completely modernized. And then you have the last question, which is kind of broad across distribution, generation, transmission. I think the previous in-person Seagra session was about the internet of the future, this 4.0 industrial economy. So I'm seeing that long durations, that's excellent. And I'm saying that's excellent is because that moves us beyond our comfort zone. Our comfort zone, grid forming inverter, distribution, modernization, this is all the expertise are there. Now you're talking about long duration storage. Now you gotta move into hydrogen space. Now you gotta move into thermal storage space. You gotta move to other places because this decarbonization is not just for the power system. You know, if you are a Seagray young in career, I think the next generation network you will shape the future of humanity. And I'm not making it up. If you look at what's happening on weather, if you look at what's happening in climate, if we can't manage our carbon emission, we're looking at a future and this is the group. And everybody else around the world that is working on power system, you are the tip of the spear. Now, technology is important, don't get me wrong, but technology is not the only thing that will get us to 2030 or 2015 at zero. So the next slide of question, I think the one after this, is going to talk about, well, technology is a big piece. Policy and regulation is a big piece. Market structure, financial is a big piece. Do we have the workforce? Do we have the supply chain to build all those tall bar graphs that you saw that we have to build throughout the world? 
So I want to get your sense on where you think, and as you are answering those questions, and as you can see the slide that I just skipped, that slide was my answer. Um, uh, my answer was not long duration storage. My answer was modernizing the distribution grid, bringing supply and demand, actively managing both. So that was my answer. So that was, I didn't want to give up my answer before you guys were voting on it. So if I look at the answers that are coming, that's another great, great, I didn't expect that. Most of us, I think, are all technical. You know, we, we've got power systems, but I think you realize, and this is where CGRE, IEEE, IEC, EPRI, all other organizations will have to play a role. Speaking the fact about power to people in power should be our objective. We can't just develop transformer guidebooks. We can't just develop all the thousands of very important technical work that we do. We need to step up in each one of our country, and we need to talk about why do we need capacity. We need to talk about how fast can you bring wind and solar if you don't have sufficient balancing resources. We need to talk about market needs to value capacity and energy equitably. It cannot be just an energy-only value. And this expands what we do at Seagray. I'm going to make sure I can move the next slide. There you go. So markets, policy and markets, you put the emphasis on that. I know Seagray has working group on markets. And some ways say you got to do all four. So what it is asking you, the first one is, you know, maybe the market design that we have is not going to work. Pessimist, uh, more optimistic is, yeah, it will work, but we got to figure out how to value flexibility. We got to figure out how to value resiliency. So if you were given the magic wand to change the market, which one would be the most important thing that you will do? New approaches for flexibility and resiliency. Okay, good. Not a lot of um, full optimism or full pessimism. So basically, market structure are well able to deal, except 14%. Markets won't be able to deal. So you are all saying glass is half full. And we got to figure out how to bring the services, the resiliency, flexibility, inertia, um, flexibility for ramp rate. All these should be market services that are needed. Can we do that? It has been tough to just get a capacity market working in many parts of the US and other places. So now we got to have a flexibility market. We got to have an inertia market. We got to have a resiliency market. Is that the way we will do this transition? Profound question, but we will have to work and see if that's the way to proceed or not. I'm going to talk about, so this is today, this is this decade. We'll be building a lot of wind and solar. You saw what we need to do on the grid side. You saw how important it is on the market side. But let's step back or step forward into the future. And if I can get my next slide. So this is where, assume we are doing this secret session in 2030. And assume we have been successful. A lot of the countries have met their goals that they have set up for 2030. What are you gonna do now? What are you gonna do beyond 2030? You can't electrify, hard to electrify sectors. What happens in the US, the, all the gas turbines that we're building? And this is really where we expand our thinking. Clean electricity will create clean molecules. Those are the clean molecules today that are natural gas, that are petroleum. They are the lifeblood of the economy. If we cannot create clean molecules from clean electricity, hydrogen is just one example. Liquid ammonia, synthetic methane. And the entire thing about production, delivery, and end use, there is so much work that needs to be done. We are not even scratching the surface, and Seagre needs to be in the center of that. I'm going to give you another QR code. This is not a question. The next slide has a QR code, I'm going to stop using this. I'm going to just look at, uh, yeah, I'm going to go to the previous slide. Previous slide, the one before. There you go. So if you want to know what's happening globally, 
the largest global collaboration on producing hydrogen from clean electricity, go to the QR code, go to the LCRI website, and see how the global community is coming in. Now, assume we are successful with hydrogen. Assume we have been able to decarbonize. Let's say ambitiously many countries are net zero by 2050. If you look at the next slide, that brings up my last part of what a climate-ready power system is. I mentioned about IPCC. I mentioned IPCC in the context of they are the preponderance of science to tell us what the future weather will look like. It's the report that came out a couple of months ago. I just took one slide. Oh, that report is dense with data and information. And what that slide is showing is if you look at the x-axis, the x-axis is showing what happens when the temperature starts going up. It has a one degree C, one and a half degree C, two degree C. If you're not successful in decarbonization that quickly, it may be three degrees C. So that's how warming happens. And when that warming happens, what increases is the probability of extreme weather that we are seeing right now firsthand. Probability of heat wave, probability of flooding, places that have never flooded will flood. So if you've got a EHV substation, don't wait for that flood to happen. There are now science and modeling that are available that you can bring in that can predict within a 10 square mile region what the future wind speed, what the future ice loading, what the heating condition, what the cooling condition could be. We gotta now take that information of predicting the future in your region, in your utility, and we gotta see how do we change the design basis. If we were building transmission lines in the Gulf Coast in the United States at 130 miles an hour, wind, wind withstand capability, should it be 150? A lot of technical work has to be done. And if you go to the next slide, you will see that work has started in earnest at Seagray and other places. So get that QR code, go to the website. It just has started. It is a new initiative, another global initiative, Climate Ready. We took the liberty of spelling ready with an I, not with a Y. Because ready stands for RE is resilience, AD is adaptation, and I is initiative. Because time has come for us not to wait for the next weather event, not to wait for 2040. Do it now. The infrastructure that you're building, that you have already built, will be there in 2040, will be there in 2050. You have to proactively start doing resiliency planning. Because if we are not, and in the meanwhile we are electrifying transportation, and we are using electricity to cl create clean hydrogen, the world of power system has gone three, four, five times bigger. Imagine if the power goes out for three days, what's gonna happen in that future society. So I'm gonna end up with the last slide where I'm gonna say I didn't answer any question, but you did answer a lot of my questions through a Slido. So you can take that QR code, link, go to the LinkedIn, and connect with me, and ask me any questions that you have that I didn't answer, and I look forward to seeing you at the reception after this. So thank you again for your time. It's my honor and pleasure to be here today, and I'm gonna hand it over for the most exciting part of today, which are the award ceremony, and I want to make sure this goes to the right person. Thank you very much.